This is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology and the impact tech is having on the law. I'm Chad Main, the founder of Legal Services Company Percipient. On today's episode, I'm talking the future of mediation dispute resolution with Mitch Jackson. He's a seasoned trial attorney, mediator, and a Web3 believer. Web3, that's been a buzzword of late, but it can be a pretty amorphous concept. So what is it exactly? I think a good way to approach thinking about Web3 is thinking about the evolution of the web. So the first version of the web, which some people call Web 1.0, is kind of like the library. It's the early stage of the internet where websites just are static and all you can do is get information from them. Then we move to Web 2, which is the current state of the web. Some people call this the social web. It's a two-way conversation between the people that have websites and the people that use the websites, like social media websites. Those rely on user-generated content, and it's interactive, but the thing is, it's centralized. As we all know, the big corporations control the vast majority of the internet. And then we move to Web 3.0, and the goal of Web 3 is to be a decentralized version of the internet, meaning there's no essential authority that controls the information in the platforms. How does this get accomplished in the Web 3 world? Well, first we got the decentralization piece. Data and content are not stored in a single place like Web 2.0, but they're distributed across computers all over the world. Also very important to Web 3 is blockchain technology. Using blockchain helps maintain security and trust without needing a central authority. It also facilitates transactions in the Web 3 world with the use of cryptocurrencies. And then there's the really important piece of ownership and privacy. That's the real promise of Web 3.0. Users have more control of their data and can own a part of the internet through tokens. They can also decide what they want to share and what to keep private. So, in a nutshell, the aspirational view of Web3 is about building an internet where people aren't just users, but they're also stakeholders and contributors, and it's a more open, secure, and equitable digital world. All right, so let's get back to today's show, which is a conversation with Mitch Jackson. He's a seasoned attorney and a busy mediator, but he's also a big believer in Web3, and he really thinks it'll have a positive impact on the law. In my conversation with Mitch, he gives us his thoughts on how technology, specifically Web3, will transform the legal landscape, and how it will impact dispute resolution. He also fills us in about how today he uses AI to facilitate mediations and how he uses VR to engage with clients. We also delve into dispute resolution of the future, with cases being tokenized and consulting AI about potential resolutions. So, how does Mitch get from a traditional legal practice to one steeped in Web3 concepts? It was not a linear path for sure. Mitch has been everything from a cowboy, a ski bum, and he even started his law practice out of the back of his car, Lincoln Lawyer style. I was kind of a jack of all trades and a master of none. I was the first one for my family to go to college, much less law school. So I came in with a fresh slate. I grew up in a ranch in Tucson, Arizona. I was a cowboy growing up. Always had 25, 30 head of horses. And uh, we had a lawyer living up the driveway from us who I got to know. We did some scuba diving trips in Mexico when I was growing up. And I used to listen to his war stories. He was a, an assistant district attorney in Tucson. Uh, his name was Fred Bellman, God rest his soul. And he, when I met him, he was in private practice. And I was intrigued, Chad, by the stories. To me, it sounded a lot like athletics, trying cases. You practice all week, and whoever's the most prepared is going to go in. And it's Friday night lights, you know, in the courtroom. And so um, that's what wet my whistle as to the practice of law. It was a ski bum for a couple of years, which brought me from Arizona to Northern California. Got in Mammoth. South Lake Tahoe, and then uh, ended up down here in uh, Southern California to go to law school. Never looked back. I met my wife in law school, my partner, Lisa Wilson, and uh, it's just been a fun ride for the last 30 plus years. Did you begin your practice in Orange County or were you somewhere else to start? I started my practice out of the back of my car playing basketball all day long down at Main Beach. My first two clients were the guys I ran the courts with, criminal defendants, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and, um, but what I also did is I was uh, clerking for five to six different lawyers on the same floor in the Imperial Bank building across from South Coast Plaza. A lot of very well-known lawyers. Some went on to become judges, huge clients. So I, I immediately was immersed in this environment where I could, you know, wet my whistle when it comes to personal injury, bankruptcy, criminal defense, family law business litigation. So I did a little of everything for the first couple of years of my practice and gravitated over to helping, you know, individuals and families that have been harmed by the wrongdoing of others, uh, primarily catastrophic injury and wrongful death cases, 
when the internet came out in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, because I started practicing in 86, that evolved to Web 2, Web 3, and what we're doing today, my interest gravitated to all of the above. And so our practice today has a lot to do with business litigation. We're still handling catastrophic injury and wrongful cases, wrongful death cases, but I'm enjoying the technology side of what we're doing. And then for, like I mentioned to you before we went live, over the last couple of years, and I've mediated hundreds of cases, you know, over the course of my career, I've been a mediator for the Orange County Bar Association, Orange County Superior Court, mandatory settlement conferences. But a couple of years ago, I purposefully started transitioning into private mediation and I'm loving every minute of it. It's so much fun to kind of put all these years of experience, all these different ways to to resolve issues into play to help lawyers and their clients, uh, you know, turn conflict into collaboration. And now what's exciting is with everyone being comfortable with Zoom or Riverside or, or platforms like this with 5G technology, with the ability to, to handle court cases, litigation, and mediations, leveraging this technology, plus the technology we're going to be talking about, it makes the practice of law fun again. Like I'm more excited today. I just told you the reason I'm so casual, everybody, is I literally just got off my paddleboard down at Dana Point Harbor. I did an early paddle with some friends and um, it's made practicing law fun again. I'm more excited rolling out of bed today after 37 years of practicing law than I've ever been in my life. So it's been an interesting journey, and I'm speaking from experience, both good and bad. And that's why I was excited to be on your show today, Chad. When do you start thinking about becoming a mediator? When do you actually start mediating? It, it sounds like you started through like, Orange County Superior Court, through referrals there. Or is that what, what got you going? So I think what got me going was court-ordered mediations before trial. There are cases that we didn't want to waste our time mediating on that the judges ordered us back in the day, you need to take this into mediation before I'm going to find your courtroom to try this case. So I'd say back in the late 80s, early 90s, we were doing a lot of court-ordered mediations. I was watching the process. My takeaway, Chad, was even when we were not able to mediate a resolution, I always learned something from what happened during the mediation. You know, what's their weak point? What are the buttons that I can push? What's important to them that I didn't realize before walking into that mediation? And then what I've learned is, it's just a great way, especially with Web3 technology, which is so new. What are the IP rights in, when it comes to artificial intelligence and a company using content for marketing or media? It's so new right now that what we're noticing is a lot of companies don't want to spend a lot of time and money in a public forum adjudicating an issue where nobody knows how a judge or a jury is going to rule because it's so new. Getting them into a private mediation is a perfect venue to protect their privacy, to amicably resolve issues so that everyone can learn from their mistakes privately and then move on and hopefully each side continuing to provide exemplary client experiences, right? So this is just a good time for that private mediation option, I think, when it comes to business. So we jumped in and I'm, en I'm enjoying it. It's fun. How much of your day nowadays is spent on mediation versus your own practice? Well, we're doing one or two mediations a week right now, kind of balancing it out. And uh, I would consider myself, you know, still a full-time trial lawyer when I'm not paddling, when I'm not out going <laughs> for a run. But, you know, I, I think it's really important to balance, you know, what's important in life with what we do for a living, whether we're changing tires, whether we're trying cases, or we're, you know, we're curing cancer, whatever, whatever it is, we want to balance that. So I really try to focus on balancing all of the above, and I'm having a good time doing it. So a lot of your writing, you've written many books, but a couple, you know, I read a couple for, to be prepared today. You've got one called Web3, Metaverse, and AI. You've got another one called From Blockchain to AI, 14 Tech Trends that Every Lawyer Should Know. What draws you to Web3, and why is it that lawyers should know about it? I mean, we, we all kind of know about AI and understand that, but Web3 is something different. What about it got you interested in that, and why... Is that pertinent to the legal profession? I think it's changing. I know it's changing everything. The, the decentralized technology, specifically things that uh, when I mentioned NFTs or non-fungible tokens, or fast forward to February of this year, 2023, Bitcoin ordinals, which is similar to a 
a digitalized token, but it's on the Bitcoin blockchain. It's a brand new uh, product. It allows us to do things that, frankly, human beings and business owners were never able to do before. The first book you mentioned, the Web3 AI and Metaverse Handbook, that came into fruition after I got off stage in Toronto. I gave the closing keynote at a lawyer convention, a large convention. Uh, we had uh, 30 different countries represented, something like 20 different states were represented, hundreds of lawyers in the audience. Everybody was interested in Web3 Metaverse and AI technology, but nobody knew what to ask. They were afraid to raise their hand and ask about the blockchain or smart contracts because they didn't know what they were. So when I came home, it was during the Christmas break, and I, I asked my son, who recently graduated from the USC Marshall School of Business, and he's now a post-creative statistics at uh, Vayner Media in Los Angeles. Oh, that's for Gary Meter, right? So he's getting a lot of good experience. And um, I said, Garrett, we need to, to leverage AI to help us put together research and write a book, basically defining in three or four pages each of the different topic areas in Web3 metaverse and AI. So a partner, a managing partner in a big firm can pick it up and within two or three minutes have a working understanding of what a smart contract is or a non-fungible token or whatever it may be and sit down with a client or with an expert and have a an intelligent conversation. Because this stuff's not rocket science. It's just new terminology. It's new approaches to business. And so we put the book together with the help of AI. We wanted to walk our talk. I mean, and it really took off. It really helped people easily and quickly wrap their arms around this new technology. The reason it's important is it's going to allow us to do things within seconds that are taking hours, days, weeks, and even months to do, especially in the legal profession in the past. Uh, instantly using smart technology and blockchain technology, uh, resolving cases, tapping into databases, uh, leveraging AI to help cases get settled, to help our clients make smart decisions. This is the technology that we're layering our efforts on top of that will allow us to be better, faster, more accurate, and create better client experiences. So those are the reasons you see me writing and learning and sharing my enthusiasm about Web3. When we come back, Mitch tells us how he facilitates client meetings, mediations in the metaverse, and the potential for AI to augment dispute resolution efforts. I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Technically Legal. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. Before I get back to my conversation with Mitch Jackson, I want to let you know, like I always do, if you go to tlpodcast.com, there's a dedicated page to this episode and for every episode we've done. On those pages, you'll find more information about our guests, links to some of the stuff we talk about, and more information about how to get a hold of them. Also, if you want to subscribe, you can find us on all major podcast platforms. And while you're there, if you like us enough, hope you give us a positive review or tell a friend. And if you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at cmain at percipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co. Or you can catch me on LinkedIn or X. All right, let's get back to my conversation with Mitch Jackson. He's just about to fill us in about how he holds client meetings in the metaverse. You know, trying to tell somebody what the metaverse, the modern metaverse is like, is like trying to give somebody a haircut over the telephone. It's, it's just impossible to do. But once you put on the headset, once you're in there, it just changes everything. It feels like you and I are in the same room. That's how realistic it is. And uh, it's not going away. It's only going to be getting better and better, especially with AI available now to help leverage some of these new metaverse offices, conference rooms, and platforms. So what we're doing, for example, is if you wanted to uh, have me mediate a case, you would come into, just like you would with a Zoom, I would send you a link. You can come into our virtual office space, our conference room, our campus, our boardroom, depending on what the purpose of the mediation or meeting is, using your headset, using your phone, using your tablet, laptop, or desktop. It's that easy. Obviously, a headset improves the experience by about 95%. And I tell people, just think about it as a Zoom on steroids. It allows us to do a lot of things without you having to travel, without you having to, uh, because you're using an avatar, 
You could actually mediate your case, Chad, in your pajamas if you want to. I'm not going to know the difference. And so it's just another option that a lot of my younger entrepreneur clients, a lot of startups are asking us if that's an option. They'd rather do that than on a Zoom. So it's kind of fun to play around with this new technology and uh, be able to, for example, if we have a products liability case and there's a defective product, you're in New York, I'm in Los Angeles, uh, we could actually pop into a private metaverse space. We can hold and handle and turn and look at this defective product. You can say, Mitch, rotate it over. You can take it from my hands. You can show me what broke and why it broke in a way that we spent 15 or 20 minutes having a quality conversation. That's just not, a, it's not, you're not able to do that via Zoom. You're able to do that in real life if somebody picks up the tab to fly you across the country to meet with me. And that's the practice I grew up with doing. We used to do that, right? So I remember how it used to be. And now we're having these meaningful, really valuable meetings in different virtual spaces to do these types of things. Now, is it set up like the traditional mediation where you have a general session with everybody and then you do breakout rooms and breakout sessions? Is it, is it set up the same way? I assume it is. It is. And what I was talking about was just client meetings, meetings with experts, okay? But when we do have mediations, they're very similar to Zoom mediations. We have private breakout rooms, and I usually will bounce back and forth between the rooms, whether it's on Zoom or in a virtual space, uh, four-hour, eight-hour blocks, depending on what the what the parties need, just like a traditional mediation. And then one of the beautiful things about using technology, Chad, is while the parties are in their respective breakout rooms discussing options or discussing what we talked about, I can then pop out into a new tab and run questions, run requests for solutions to get me past an impasse. Uh, what we do is we'll take clients, both during Zoom and virtual mediations, we'll take confidential mediation briefs, we'll take, it's an outline that I have that has your personality, the personality of opposing counsel, the personality of the partners, what are their wishes? What are their likes? What are their desires? What's their desired outcome? We put all this into a private database. And so if there's an impasse during the mediation, and I'm pretty good at get, getting past impasses by asking open-ended questions, but having said that, I can pop out, copy and paste a prompt into this particular database, run it, and it'll give me 10 open-ended questions to come back in and ask you, Chad, to keep the conversation going, or maybe to analyze settlement options and, and suggest an option that the parties haven't even thought about. We did this with the writer's strike up in Los Angeles. Uh, we took each side's position, uh, we put it into the database that I'm talking about, and we asked the AI, share a memorandum providing us with possible solutions to get past these hurdles that each side has. And within about 45 seconds to a minute, it spit out, I'm going to say a 12-page proposal or memorandum, just a test, right, that turned out to be pretty darn close to what they ended up agreeing to in the initial settlement. And I shared it on LinkedIn. You know, I was very transparent. Here are the facts. Here's something we're just trying out. Let me know what you think. I had uh, representatives from both sides reach out to me. This is really cool. What a great example of how we can resolve this issue. But how do we let the other side know that AI was behind the resolution proposals, right? AI was the big issue and sticking point in this. How do you embrace something that's causing you a headache? Right. You know, so it was just one of these things where we'll all get past that eventually. In fact, I'm, I'm writing a new article about it this afternoon on the ethics of using AI in our practices, in our businesses, you know, it is just another tool depending on how you use it. And it's going to complement all of us being better and faster and, and really getting getting better results for our clients. So that's how we're using it in these spaces. And you mentioned you, you're a prolific writer. You post a lot on LinkedIn. And in fact, the reason I reached out to get in touch with you is you wrote a great article, which I'll put a link to on the episode page, about what dispute resolution could look like in 2025. I think 2025 was the year. But in that article, you raise a you raise a bunch of different stuff, and you got my wheels turning right there when you talked about how you'll pop out of the mediation room, out of the the breakout sessions, and then go to AI to help come up with some some open ended questions or 
or things like that to get the things going. But I, I just started thinking about it. You were saying that, you know, there's always that point in the mediation where it's the end of the day, get laid, and you just ask the mediator for a range or what have you. You know, it's that would be another great use case for AI, right? Where AI could tap into legitimate jury verdict databases or settlement databases and come up with like real world ranges of what a case tailored to whatever the specifics of that case are to the, the parties at mediation trying to resolve that. that, that that's an interesting use case. Do you th think that should be used or should we just leave mediation as it is where you're not going to rely on stuff like that and kind of just stick to the old process? Well, you know, I, I spoke at the uh, ClioCon convention in Nashville and I was on the AI panel and um, we talked about this with the audience. And what I was telling everyone is what I see happening is I actually see our legal profession embracing Bitcoin ordinal technology. The reason I say ordinals, everyone, is that NFT technology, if you have a legal case, and here's what I see happening. I see a new case coming in. Instead of filing it, paperwork, or uploading it with the court, what I see happening is we actually click a couple of buttons and it's converted into a non-fungible token. It's converted into a digital file. Instead of an NFT that resides on some third-party server, which is the way it works uh, on the ETH blockchain, for example, a Bitcoin ordinal, this, this data is encrypted and it's actually part of the Bitcoin blockchain forever. There's no third-party servers. We don't have to worry about somebody not paying the bill and so that, that, that server farm goes out of business and your data, your NFT, your case file is gone. Your data is contained on the blockchain, okay? Now, having said that, opposing counsel does the same thing. This same data should be able to, in the near future, access almost any database you can think of, whether it's a database of settlements of breach of contract cases throughout the United States or around the world, whether that database takes into consideration the personalities of the judges assigned to the case uh, or the lawyers that are, that are handling the case for mediation, arbitration, or trial. Everything is happening via smart contract technology through this Bitcoin ordinal, this part of your case file. And the reason I'm, I'm laying this out is because I do feel there's going to be an option that literally within seconds, with all parties in agreement, we'll be able to tap or swipe or press a button and ask the AI to instantly propose based upon the information that's been instantly added to this Bitcoin ordinal, a proposed resolution and or a final binding resolution. As you see, that's not much different than binding arbitration, right? I mean, you're at the mercy of the three arbitrators, or if it's one or however many it is, right? It's the same thing, just submitting that the arbiter will be a piece of technology, right? And it, it, it is what it is. You, Both sides can feed in their briefs to the best that they draft them, and then the AI decides, right? Absolutely. And the reality is, if the AI algorithm, if the uh, LLMs, the data sets that we're relying upon, I have more confidence in them coming back with legitimate, reasonable, objective, fair, and equitable proposals or findings than I do with a private mediator or judge that gets 90% right. of his, her, or their business from the insurance industry, and you're the other side, you're the plaintiff's attorney trying to come in and have a fair shake when it comes to the mediation process. So I actually think it's going to uh, help ensure fairness, equity, and more consistent findings or final judgments or verdicts than what we're experiencing today. And um, how does that affect the legal practice? How does that affect the legal industry? It doesn't take two, three, four, five years to litigate a case anymore. It takes two, three, four, or five minutes if all the data is put in the correct way. So I'm excited about what's going to happen in the future. But with that upside comes the downside. You know, are the data sets that are rendering the results that right. we're asking them to resent, you know, are they fair? Are they clean? Are they biased? So you mentioned before, a judge can be biased. He doesn't like the plaintiff's haircut, so he's not going to side their way. But so, right, you still have this risk in AI where that maybe there wasn't the intent to be biased, but it didn't have the sufficient data for one side to, to come out with a complete issue of the case, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, Back in Nashville at the event, uh, which was just you know last month, and that's why I'm bringing it up. It's current. It's recent. Uh, you know, some of the feedback we got from the audience members had to do with the New York case where the attorney stood in front of the judge and submitted a brief and I guess oral argument based upon cases. That yeah, didn't bad exist, cases, right? Okay. What I shared with everyone is two weeks before that, I'm standing in court 
down at the other side of council table was a lawyer citing bad law. And it wasn't on AI, right? It was just his bad research, right? It had nothing to do with AI. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. I know this lawyer and uh, this individual simply made a mistake, okay? And I also know that this lawyer was probably more interested in that afternoon's tea time <laughs> and his force amount on the course than correcting the problem. AI, when it's trained properly, will correct itself. It'll check itself. The due diligence aspects of having that being avoided, I'm putting my money on AI as opposed to human beings. I think it's more efficient. I think there are checks and balances you can build into the smart contract type of technology. Well, there's no emotion. Presumably, writing can be emotional, and the data that's trained on can be emotion. But I mean, it's going to be less emotional than a human being. Yeah. One of the uh, co-panelists has a software product where they're using AI for legal research. When you think of Lexus and Westlaw, think of all of that. I can't think of the name of the company, but it's basically all AI generated. He's a brilliant uh, lawyer and technologist and AI expert. And uh, we ran some tests and it immediately using simple keywords found responses that were spot on. I know they were spot on to the case analysis because it was a case that I tried here in California that made new law. Now, what was cool was that it then brought up a case from 2020 I wasn't aware of that took my case and actually expanded it a bit, expanding that appellate decision here in California, which is great because I'm very passionate about what that case was all, all about. I would have never found that case had I not used Ed's system. And so it's just one of these things where, look, I was around before the internet. I remember what it was like to, to share jury instructions with opposing counsel and how expensive it was to FedEx or UPS, you know, 400 pages of documents, old school stuff, right? Then the internet came along and we, you know, soon enough, we were able to email things to each other. We were able to Dropbox, Google Drive things to each other. Now we have cloud-based, you know, storage facilities that we can share content with each other in, in, in a you know very uh, protective and secure fashion. This is just the next step. I think leveraging Web3 technology, AI technology with what you and I are talking about when it's case management, when it comes to case resolutions, there are just a lot of different ways that all of us can use this technology to be better lawyers. I told everybody back in Nashville, I was getting ready to pick a jury in a very conservative venue. And so what I did, and I'm pretty good at picking a jury. I've tried a lot of cases. What I did, though, is we put into a AI data set the makeup of that community, whether it has to do with business, politics, current events, what is the makeup of these jurors? And then I put in what my case was about, what I was looking to achieve. Give me 10 open-ended questions that I can oh, ask my jurors during jury selection, during blood ire, that will help me ensure that I've got the right jurors sitting on my jury. And eight out of the 10, I actually had already planned on asking, but there were two very powerful questions that I then went back in. And you know this, Chad, the power of, of GPT-4, for example, is reprompting and reprompting and diving a little bit deeper. And I immediately went back and said, well, these are the three issues I'm concerned with or that I want to focus on. Give me 20 more questions based upon those three issues. And then it instantly spat out 20 more open-ended questions. And then with three of them, I followed up on the evidence that I have and what additional expert witnesses might be needed in order for me to raise those issues during white ire address them again during opening statement, and then present the evidence to keep my promise in front of a jury. It immediately turned out, these are the authenticity and foundational issues you're going to have. These are the six different types of experts you may need. You might want to, with expert number six, go back in and ask your jury, would they give this expert in this particular area of practice any credibility? Coming from a conservative venue, how will they handle this expert coming into their courtroom and testifying? So I think we can play around with this technology in all ways, shapes, forms, and fashions with our, you know, with our uh, imagination as the only limitation. But I got to tell you, I mean, like I've, I've tried over 70 cases and I know what I'm doing in the courtroom and not, I'm talking, you know, two, three, four week jury trials, not just court hearings for an hour. And I was blown away by the suggestions by this process. And this is brand new. What's it going to be like right. in a year? Like one of the things that's really blowing me away, and I think caught everybody's attention at, at Clio, 
is I talked about the new GPT-4 vision, where you can simply take a picture with your phone of a whiteboard in a courtroom where the other side's drawn an equation, or maybe there's an accident scene that's that's put up. And you can actually instantly ask GPT-4, tell me if this equation's accurate. What questions should I ask an expert to document and, and, and drill holes in what's depicted in this picture? And it instantly gives you responses, whether it's a list of 100 names, whether it's a chart of 20 different products, you know, instantly taking that data via a picture and then converting it based upon your prompt into a response that offers you certain suggestions, whether it's questions, whether it's putting that into a spreadsheet, whether it's, you know, anything else in between. It's just unbelievable to me. To those ends, too, you, on the fringes here, another question I had for you. In, in that article, you talk about using AI for emotion analysis for to test veracity of witnesses. What do you foresee there? How can that be used in a courtroom or even in, in a mediation or even a deposition? Well, I think what you're referring to, and, and I wrote an article 10 years ago about trying a case with my toes in the sand, using a virtual reality type of setup and heptonic type of devices, whether it's a watch on a wrist that monitors a heartbeat, whether it's something that monitors your breathing. Uh, there's a TED Talk by a professor, I think it's Edelman, if I'm not mistaken, where that's what they did. They talked about how human beings can really digest so much more information by, than what we see or hear. It's a very complicated thing. But I wrote a post about it 10, 15 years ago, whatever it was. And fast forward to today, the same approach now is available to all of us where not only will we be able to listen to what someone's saying, but with these devices, these wearable devices, we're going to be able to pick up uh, almost like a lie detector, but it's, it has more to do with breathing and heartbeat, whether or not a jury's paying attention to what you're saying, for example. Let's say you've got a two-hour direct examination. You and I both know there's nothing worse than boring the jury to death. They don't want to be there. They don't like lawyers. They'd rather be home with their families. So when you're in there, you've got to make it pop. They watch television. They expect the trials to be like what they watch on TV. Imagine being able to, in real time, monitor the enthusiasm, the interest of your jurors while all of this is happening. And you know we're a long ways out from that happening. But these are things that, that get me going. And I think it's important. That is interesting, though, because I'm sure there'd be some constitutional issues where can you hook a, a, a monitor up to a witness? I mean, is that it's a, all yeah, that's interesting? Well, but what if there what if there's a subpoena? Like they're compelled to testify. You know, I don't I don't know. It's interesting. No, absolutely, absolutely. So back in the day when remember Google Glass, the first wearable. Right. All right. So Thompson Rudders hooked me up with a pair, and they wanted me to try a case using Google Glass. And everybody needs to understand this was in a 3G world, so we didn't have fast uh, Wi-Fi internet connections. That was the downfall of Google Glass. Uh, they were using Google Hangouts. And the idea was they wanted me to pick a jury. And while I'm picking a jury, an expert on the other side of the country is listening to the response and feeding me in the air follow-up questions on what he or she thinks I should ask. And we had a stipulation from the other side, stipulation of the court. Everyone wanted to try this thing out just for fun, right? My biggest concern was the geek factor. Am I <laughs> going to, you know, am I going to give the jury the wrong first impression by wearing these things? Both of the cases settled, so I didn't have an opportunity to do this. But it started getting me to think, wow, this is really amazing technology. Whether young associates back in the firm are watching through a first person right. point of view, me, me picking a jury. How valuable is that, right? Or you've got experts assisting you during the course of a trial, maybe running a database check on the answers that you're getting, feeding it in real time. We can have someone sitting next to us in court doing that. Uh, why can't they be on the other end of an earbud tapping into an AI database? So these are the things that via a stipulation, full written consent, these are things that might be possible to use in mediations, arbitrations, and trials. I think from a practical standpoint right now, I would love to see every lawyer right now spending time with GPT-4, especially with the new rollouts this week. Play around with it. Have fun with it. Get a feel for what it means to prompt and ask questions and follow-up questions. That alone is going to change your practice, whether it's the quality of the templates, of the emails, 
text and letters that you're using, whether it's the content you're sharing to help market and brand your law firm, whether it's giving you ideas where you put your opening statement and your closing argument into it and say, what did I miss? If you were a jury, how would you rule after listening to this opening or closing argument? When we talk about emotions, I just read something the other day where when you ask GPT-4 and let it know that its response may affect good or bad your career, it may help you achieve a very important outcome that's important for the local community or for society in general. When you add these extra parameters into your GPT-4 prompts, it will give you a better response. And it's something like a 30 to 40% rate. It's amazing. So I started doing that over the last couple of days. And the prompts that we're getting, the responses are better. Like it actually comes across like it cares about the response that it's going to give you. So I don't know if it's just something that tags this LLM, the large language model systems, spend a little bit more time in creating this response. You know, I, it doesn't have emotion. Right. But, you know, people need to understand using the word please when you're using a prompt, um, letting it know how important this particular response is, it does make a difference in the quality of the output. And uh, I'm all about quality results for the clients. And so every little advantage that I can get, whether it's knowing which school the judge went to and which team he, she, or they support back in their chambers, helmets, mascots, whatever it may be, to, you know, whether or not opposing counsel's daughter runs cross country, like my daughter did in high school. These are all little things that you can use to really help maximize the chances of getting a better result for a client. And you know that. And I think AI allows us to do all of that 100x in 30 to 60 seconds. That's the powerful part. It's interesting times. And it's, I, I agree, it's going to, practice law is going to be different. It's not going to replace lawyers. It's going to change the way that we do work. And, and the good ones are going to figure out how to, how to use it just with some of the creative ideas that you, uh, you've you come up with. So It's going to make good lawyers better. Better. Yep. That's what AI is going to do. Make good lawyers better. And will it make an average lawyer good? Maybe maybe that's what raises the bar for them. Mitch, thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. If people want to get a hold of you, what about your mediation practice, your legal practice, find your books, where do you want to send them? Probably the best place to go, Chad, would be my blog, MitchJackson.com. Everything's there and uh, including links to all the other platforms that I'm involved with. And so I love talking about this stuff. I love uh, answering questions in the DM. So if anyone has any follow-up questions or needs, just reach out to me and uh, we'll do the digital dance together. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.